Hello. Hi. Namaskara. Bonjour. Today we present to you yet another story from Salam Molière. And it is Tartuffe. Tartuffe. 1664. It was meant to be a short comedy, but turned out into a long, drawn persecution for the Duke. Not even Molière's friend, the king, could stop the hounding that followed Tatu. It came under immense scrutiny from the aristocracy. The court had to ban the play. But what was it about Tatu that caused so much resentment? It was the dig and unscrupulous godmen, Swamiji's of that time. Tatu was one. But the play is not just about the godmen. Godmen, after all, thrive on the gullibility of ordinary men. And women? Yes, yes, women and Swamiji, Swamiji and women. Nothing has changed in 350 years. But in this story, the victim is a man, but not without a woman involved. His name is Ochgod, a rich man, a weak and foolish head of a rich household who falls to the wily charm of imposture. Tattoo. Argon appears possessed. He returns from an out of town trip. His maid, Doreen, is worried about her mistress. Argon talks hardly about Tattoo. It's all been well these two days have gone. These past few days, Madam told of the fever and a fierce headache that refused to leave her. And Tartu! Tartu? Well, he's round and red and excellently fed. Poor fellow. Last night at the dinner table, Madam was unable to have a single bite. Her headache, she said, was simply hellish. And Tartu? Tartu? He ate his meal with relish and seriously devoured a leg of mutton and a brace of pheasants. Poor fellow. After much ado, we asked her to dispatch someone to the doctor. The doctor came, bled her, and the fever quickly fell. And the tattoo? Why, he bore it very well. To make up for the blood Madam has lost, he had four quarts full of wine. Poor fellow. In short, both are doing well. I'll go tell Madam that you've shown keen interest and a lot of love for her. We find out that Orgon has decided to give away his daughter, Marianne, to... Tartuf. Marianne, of course, has a lover. His name is Galea. He's earlier been approved by the parents. Now it gets complicated. First, the father offers the daughter's hand to Tatu. Then the daughter agrees to marry Tatu, at least in his presence. Meanwhile, Tatu, the house is, has his eyes on Papa's wife's man. Marianne and Belair have a lover's quarrel. And because of that, she doesn't want to meet him. Doreen, the maid, confronts Argon about his giving away his daughter to Tatu. He does not budge. Later, Helmer, his wife, confronts Argon about his giving away his daughter to Tatu. He does not budge. <laughs> Finally, it's up to the maid, Doreen, to solve everybody's problem and save the family. You know, in all of Molière's plays, the maids are usually the most smartest women. <laughs> oh, there's plenty of comedy in the play. It was written as a comedy after all, the comedy of the tragic fall of good sense before God men. And Satu, he finally reveals his hand. Well, you know what's interesting? Tartuf only appears in the second act of the play. And in the very beginning, he has a scene with El Mer. Hmm, here's how it goes. May heaven 
whose infinite goodness we adore, preserve your body and soul forevermore, and bless your days and answer that's the plea of one with humblest photo. I thank you for your pious wish. I trust you're once again well and strong. <laughs> there's a private matter I wish to discuss. I hope there's no one here to hinder us. I too am glad it fills my heart with bliss to find you here along with me like this. For just this chance I prayed with all my heart. I prayed in vain until it's happier. This won't take long, sir. I hope you'll be entirely frank and unconstrained with me. Quite so. And with such great fervor do I feel. Oh, ouch! Oh, you're pinching him. I never meant to cause you pain. I would rather. Oh, what could your hand be doing there? Feeling your gown. What soft, fine woven stuff. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, that I feel ticklish. Please stop. What lovely lace work on your dress. The workmanship is miraculous, no less. Ah, <laughs> sir. Quite. Uh, but shall we talk business for a bit? I hear, sir, that my husband means to break his word and give his daughter to you, sir. He did once mention it, but I confess, I dream of quite a different happiness. It is elsewhere that my eyes deserve a promise of that blissful future year. <laughs> I see you care for nothing here below. My heart is not made of stone, you know. All your desires mount heavenwards, I'm sure, in scorn of everything that's earthly and impure. A love for heavenly beauty must not preclude a proper love of earthly multitude. I vow to flee the sight of you as chewing a rapture that might prove my soul's undoing. But soon, fair being, I became aware that my deep passion would be made to bear. That rectitude and bounden duty are therefore surrender to your beauty. Oh, uh, your declaration is most gallant, sir. But don't you think it's out of character? It, it ill becomes a pious man like you. Uh, I may be pious, but I'm human too. It's your celestial charm before his eyes. A man does not have the power to be wise. Elmer, of course, is not at all surprised by Tato's behavior. But this time, she just about convinces Orgon to come and hide in the room when she meets Tato next. There's another scene with Elmer and Tato, where she suggests that it would be in order for them to continue from where they left things before. But this time we have all gone hiding and waiting, watching the whole thing. Madam, no happiness is so complete as from lips we love come words so sweet. But I must beg leave now to admit that there's a lingering doubt about my happiness. Might this not be a trick? Might not the catch be that you wish me to break off the match with my hair and to have seen to love me? I shan't trust the fond opinion of me until the feelings you express so sweetly are demonstrated somewhat more concretely. <laughs> <laughs> Why be in such a hurry? Must my heart exhaust its bounty at the very start? Well, if you look with favor upon my love, why 
then they grudge me some clear proofs thereof. But must not one be afraid of heaven's wrath? Madam, forget such fears and be my pupil, and I will teach you how to conquer scruple. Some joys, it's true, are wrong in heaven's eyes. Yet, heaven is not averse to compromise. There's a science lately formulated, whereby one's conscience may be liberated, and any wrongful act you care to mention may be redeemed the purity of the intention. I will teach you the secrets of that science. Just place on me your full reliance. Assuage my keen desires and feel no dread. A sin, if any, shall be on my head. <laughs> if you're still troubled, think of things this way. No one shall know about our joys save us alone. And there's no evil till the act is known. It's scandal, madam, that makes it an offense. And it's no sin to sin in confidence. Well, clearly I must do as you require and yield your importunate desire. I see nothing else will satisfy you, so I acquiesce. Madam, the fault is mine, if fault there be. <laughs> Open the door and look about. I don't want my husband poking about. Why worry about that man? Each day he grows more gullible. What can lead him by the nose? To find us here would fill him with delight. And if he saw the worst, he would doubt his sight. Ocon smacks out of his spell. He admits that the man is a complete monster. He's simply stunned. So what is he going to do about it? He asks Orgon to leave the house immediately. But Tatu looks at him with a defiant stare and says, well, he's in a position to ask Orgon to leave the house. He's speechless. And Mary is confused. Orgon is forced to admit that in his zeal for spiritual bliss, he's handed over the house to Tatu. It's still a comedy. Yes, it has many comic scenes and a happy ending. Well, that's it for today. So, goodbye, thank you, stay safe, wash your hands and have a great day. Bye. Bye.